Well, for my next guest, I'm gonna have to put it in soccer terms. This is the only thing he understands. It's uh, like this. You have a club that's winning two nothing at halftime, but you've been watching the game, and you know that the other team had no shots on goal, couldn't get it past midfield. You know the outcome is basically fait accompli. I did that soccer analogy because I could and because Pierce Morgan could understand it. He's the same <laughs> Pierce Morgan who hosts Uncensored, the wildly popular uh, series, and I see you in person. Pierce, welcome. Good to see you. If I'd known you was dressed down Friday, I wouldn't have worn the tie. It's so, just a little open, you know, just to show, it's people, okay. to show people my chest development. It looks like English elegance against you know, rough and tumble New Already you're going on the offensive. <laughs> it's amazing. So, uh, so, Pierce, your view overseas of an Iowa caucus, you have a true... Uh, understanding of our election system. Well, how many votes did Donald Trump lose the last national election by? He lost the election by 7 million votes, but 45,000 in key states. OK, and how many votes were you talking about in Iowa? 50,000. 50. So you talk about it being a small number. Actually, small numbers decide a lot of things in American politics. I think what was significant was the margin of the victory. And when you compare it to how Trump had done in Iowa before, 2016, he didn't even win in Iowa. This time, he doesn't just win. It's a thumping landslide victory. If he wins in New Hampshire, South Carolina, it's over. And I think he will. And if he does that, it is one of the great comebacks in political history. And I read a column for The Sun in London uh, this week likening it to when Sinatra was thrown to the wolves in the late 40s, thought his career was over, all done and dusted, and then, boom, he comes back from here to eternity, he wins an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, and his career becomes one of the most iconic in the history of American celebrity show business. Donald Trump is on the verge of pulling off a similar comeback, because I think if it's Trump v Biden, I think right now, looking at all the polling for Biden, looking at the state of him, unable to basically string a sentence together or walk in a straight line without falling over, my money would be on Donald Trump to win. And if he gets back in the White House, it is the greatest comeback in American political history. Two things are changed. You know, a lot of people say 77, nothing's going to change. Well, one thing he did is set up a great team. They, they yep. wired that place in Iowa. They had their uh, caucus captains. The round game was sensational. He didn't have that last time. And either, mm. either election, he with the White House. And number two, I'm seeing a change, too. And that is he's not talking about 2020. We discussed this before. I told him to stop doing it. Right, but everyone has. But now I think he, he believes it. Watch. What happened? You know, we get the most votes of any sitting president in history, and then somebody else takes over, and they take a look at what uh, we had versus what they have now. And the difference is so stark. It's so massive. It's so different. The country is a different place. You know, he got more votes, 74 million, than any Republican ever, but he lost. He didn't say I lost. He didn't have to. He looked ahead. We got more votes. Finally, he doesn't bang on about stolen election, rigged election from 2020. Nobody cares. I said to him to his face, listen, Mr. President, if you keep looking back, you don't have a chance of winning back the White House. If you look forward, if you present a compelling argument right. for why you can fix what you believe the problems to be in the country, and I think one of his reasons for his triumph in Iowa is, as J.P. Morgan's boss Jamie Dimon said, if you cut through all the rhetoric and the chaos and you get to actually why people want to vote for Trump this time around, it's because of things like the economy, immigration and foreign policy. Real substantive stuff. If he focuses on that, I think he's going to almost certainly win the nomination and probably win the general election. But yet, he still has to fight the headwinds. Listen to how the media handled his victory. Here he is right now under, under my voice. You hear him repeating his anti-immigrant rhetoric. There is a cost to us as a news organization of knowingly broadcasting untrue things. That is a fundamental truth of our business and who we are. And so his remarks tonight will not air here live. You know, some of his remarks were Nikki and Ronnie ran a great race. Uh, you know, they had fun. And sorry, were... Rachel Maddow banging on about disinformation and how damaging it would be to MSNBC. Didn't she lead the charge on Russia collusion? Two and a half years. years. Right? I watched that night after night. I would tune in, not for very long, and hear Russia collusion, Russia collusion on MSNBC, my former bosses at CNN. And it turned out to be complete nonsense. A massive no apology, burger. no acknowledgement, nothing. But now they have the brass neck to say we can't possibly show Trump's victory speech because he might spew disinformation. Well, what about your own backyard? Pierce, I'll bring up something else to further the analogy. The longest time they said the president was an illegitimate president. Mm -hmm. He didn't really win the election. That was okay then, but it's not okay now. 
I'm curious to see the world reaction. And one of the things I've heard is uh, not everyone is thrilled by this. I want you to see uh, what some world leaders are saying. Uh, the MI6 uh, uh, head, Sir Richard Dearlove, saying, for the UK's national security, Trump is problematic. The Canadian Prime Minister Doe says Trump wasn't easy the first time, and if there is a second time, it won't be easier either. Those two, and the third one, the Argentinian president, actually sounds a lot like Trump when he talked about the, the need to go back to capitalism, get away from socialism. Your thoughts on the world reaction well, they're all very, for the possibility? Right, so they're all very different. I think if you take uh, Trudeau, for example, he bangs on about Trump being a fascist when he is the number one woke fascist in the world, right? The most woke human being alive, and I think... He's destroying I, that country. I saw a poll last week that said more young Canadians would vote for Trump than vote for Trudeau, right? Not that they're in the same election, but they would if they could. Uh, I think in Dear Love's case, he was the former head of MI6. This is the spies which basically deal with the foreign stage. He was making the point, which is a valid one, that Trump's rhetoric about NATO can be, on the face of it, problematic, because I think he's been misinterpreted. He wanted people to pay their dues for NATO. He didn't see why America provided all the firepower but also provided the vast majority of the money. And he said, at the very least, the other countries in NATO should pay what they're supposed to pay. Well, guess what? They now pay what they're supposed to pay. I think almost all of them now have come up to where they should be on what they pay. That's a big win for Donald Trump, and he was right, and I said so at the time. But it's whether he wants to dismantle NATO altogether. If he does, that would be a big mistake. NATO is a strong, powerful entity, and never has it been more important than right now, with Vladimir Putin on the march, with China uh, looking like they're saber-rattling over Taiwan and so on. We need to have a strong, concerted NATO. But Trump was right about how that gets financed. America was basically having the others say, you take the brunt of all the military side and the economic side. Not fair. Now, last time you were with uh, President Trump was a little explosive. Do you expect a sequel? If he's watching, Mr. President, I would love to have a sequel. Uh, look, I've interviewed him, I don't know, 40 times. We've had some good ones. We've had some fractious ones. The last one got fractious because I kept saying to him, stop going on about 2020. It looks to me like, although he got angry in the moment, Mr. President, he believed me, right. and he's now twisted his campaign to listen to his friend Piers from across the pond, in which case, very sensible. Right. You know what he does? He talks to you. Unlike this president, he will sit down and talk to people that disagree with him, and it made it much more interesting. Uh, but we have a president who doesn't even want to do a rope line right now. Well, I mean, how many big interviews has Joe Biden done? I mean, literally on one hand, and none of them with what I would call his enemy, right? Mm -hmm. Has he appeared on Fox? No. And I think that's cowardly. He should. In rehearsal, you would end this segment by saying, great to see you again, Brian. I always love doing your show. Do you want to say that again? It's never good to see you again. I do it as a favor to keep, get you good ratings. You know that. I know that. I even wear a necktie because I take you more seriously than you take yourself. It's a pathetic spectacle, frankly, to turn up and find you looking like some guy off the street. But you know what? I do it because I want to help you. Thank you, Pierce. <laughs> Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.